fermented malt beverage, a blue-collar refreshment, the nectar of the gods, a party in a bottle. Yeah, all of these, and much more. It's simple, natural, a source of pride, but it's expensive, heavily taxed, and you can't be purchased or consumed by a miner. So you've decided to brew your own, and I'm going to show you some gear and you're gonna need some supplies so a little upfront cash will be necessary this is your place honey girls hi Johnny ah, I feel like a kid in a candy store well this is what you're gonna need to get yourself started you're gonna need a glass carboy that's five gallons you're gonna need a spoon you're gonna need a floating thermometer. You're going to need uh, some form of sanitizing solution. This is uh, called Diversol, but uh, household bleach will do. You're gonna need a hydrometer. This is for measuring the alcohol of the beer. That goes inside here. You're gonna need a siphoning tube, and you're gonna need four five gallon food grade plastic buckets. They have to be food grade. They can't be like garbage buckets from your garage or something like that. They got to be food grade because we're making food in these things. And you'll need uh, a couple of these. These are called airlocks. So I will explain as we go through this video how all of this stuff comes into play. This is, uh, you can pick this up. It's a basic starter homebrew kit. Uh, ooh, the stuff dreams are made from. That's if you dream when you're passed out. It is from these babies we're gonna get our sweet elixir that will ferment into beer. A fine malt beverage. Malt. What is malt? It is essentially germinated barley grain that has been dried in a kiln. It is generally considered that uh, the darker malts yield more color and flavor, but less fermentable sugar. So various combinations of malts give you various styles and uh, strengths of beer. We're gonna be making an ale. So we'll use mostly pale malt with a little bit of crystal and a little bit of chocolate for some added character. Don't short change me, bud. I wouldn't dream of it. Uh, 
There, now we've ground up the grain. We just wanna crack these babies open. We don't wanna, we don't wanna ground them too finely. You're gonna need some hops and some yeast as well. This is where a recipe book comes in handy. So it's a good idea to get some literature because it'll go into a little more detail than I'm gonna go into now. Perhaps you'll need to refer to my video, How to Read Books Without Pictures. Our recipe today, we have seven and a half pounds of pale malt, a half a pound of crystal malt, and two ounces of chocolate malt. We're using two ounces of uh, Northern Brewer hot pellets and some dry yeast. It's a Scottish style ale, something that I like to call Johnny's Rockin' Ale. I've talked about the things you're gonna need to brew the beer uh, and your ingredients. And one thing that uh, I should mention too is you should get some Irish moss. This stuff you'll uh, put in your boil while you're boiling your beer and it'll help your beer clarify. So what do we got here? We got, oh, hey, yeah, it's my bro. This is my brother, Davey Hansen. He's gonna be helping us brew some beer today. So I was just getting the stuff together. Uh, what do we got here? We got uh, seven and a half pounds of pale malt, uh, half a pound of crystal malt. We got uh, two ounces of Northern Brewer. It's gonna be a lightly hopped Scotch style ale. I got some uh, dry yeast, so there's no fuss. Uh, I think that's about everything. Uh, I better ask the eight ball in case I forgot something. It's decidedly so. What did I forget? Oh, we gotta make a mash tun. When you make your mash tun, you're gonna use a couple of those uh, food grade plastic buckets. And you also wanna pick up about uh, five feet of this uh, 3 8 hose and a couple of hose clamps. Going. You all done? Mm -hmm. Right on. So what David has made here is what is known as a mash tun. He's taken two buckets, cut the bottom off of one and drilled a bunch of holes in it. And that makes a false bottom to the other bucket. Inside here we'll put our grain and we'll soak the grain and the water will be able to drip through. 
And we'll make one more bucket like this with the hose. And this will hold our sparge water and I'll show you how to use those. So one more hole to drill. And that's three of our four food grade plastic buckets. One for the sparge, our mash tun. The fourth will be our fermenter. That's where we make the beer, eh? <laughs> and we're off like a herd of turtles. Davey here, he's got our uh, water started. It's always good to brew with your bro, that's what I always say. What he's doing is heating up 10 liters of water uh, to 73 degrees Celsius. Uh, 10 liters of water, that's one and a quarter liters for every pound of grain in our, in our recipe. We have about eight pounds of grain. So that's what you need to do to start your mash. You need to heat up one and a quarter liters of water to 73 degrees for each pound of grain in your recipe. Typical Canadian, eh? One and a quarter liters for every pound. Yeah, forget about it. Anyway, now we're going to take the water and the grain and we're going to mix them together in our mash tun. Is that ready? We got 73? Right on. Let's go. Okay, let's toss in the water. Now I'm going to give this a really good stir. You want to make sure that all the grain is really good and wet. You don't want any clumps of dry grain in there. You want to make sure it's all thoroughly mixed in. Okay, let's get the thermometer in here. Now this baby should drop about five degrees like I say and we want this mash to be between 65 and 70 degrees. 68 degrees is a good temperature to aim for. This is called a single infusion mash. We just add water and let it sit. Okay we better wrap this baby up. Okay, now we're going to let our grain soak uh, for about an hour. This is called the mash. What happens in the mash is that the starches in the grain convert to sugar, and that's what the yeast is going to eat to make our beer. Now this takes place between 65 and 70 degrees, so we're aiming for 68 degrees. That's what we wanted. Yep, still at 68. That's perfect. And we don't want that temperature to drop below 65. So, cover it up with a sleeping bag or some blankets or we use this uh, little foamy thing here. You want to sit, let to sit for at least an hour. Now if, you're, if you check the temperature and you find it's a little too hot, you can just add some cold water. If it's a little too cold, just add some boiling water. As long as it's somewhere between 65 and 70 degrees, you're okay. Alright, while I sit back and enjoy a brew, my handy helper David here. It's going to get our sparge water going. So we got about an hour to kill. Let's have a brew. Whoa, careful with that hot water, David. This water is 80 degrees Celsius. It'll scald you. So what we've done, it's been about an hour now. We've heated up our water 20 liters to 80 degrees Celsius. It's called our sparge water. We put it in our sparging bucket. We'll use this hose to dribble it over our mash and rinse the grains. Okay, before we start sparging our mash, we're going to recirculate the first couple liters of our runoff. This 
is called wort. It is essentially unfermented beer. So we'll just take the first little bit off. You just want to pour gently. You don't want to really stir up the grain there. Just pour it back in gently. When you run off the beer, you don't want to run it off too quickly. So I just open it up, give that a pinch, make sure it's coming out solid. Then I just crank it back so it's just dribbling out. We're going to be running off about 25 liters of wort. Should take about 45 minutes. Any quicker than that and you're not properly rinsing the sugars. And it's the sugars we want to make the beer. So, let's start sparging. So you want to keep the mash just wet on the top. Basically the sparge water should go in as fast as the wort is going out. So you have a nice even flow. As we collect our wort that is running off, we're going to boil it. So you need uh, two pots big enough to boil 25 liters of beer. We'll just put this in here. You want to distribute it evenly back and forth. Put these on maximum. We want to bring these to a full boil. The reason you distribute back and forth between the two pots is because at the beginning of the runoff, the wort is going to be very dark, thick and sweet. But as you're sparging, it's going to get thinner and lighter and lighter as all the sugars are being washed away. So you don't want to fill one up and have it full of really thick sweet beer and the other with really thin beer. So every pitcher you take, you put half and half in each pot. There, can you see that baby boiling? Now that we've collected 25 liters of the uh, wort, we want to get it on the stove and get it boiling. You want to boil it for a good half hour before you add the hops. This allows the... Whoa! Hey, look at that! Hey, you gotta be careful, this stuff boils over real easy. The boiling for a half an hour makes sure that the proteins are coagulating inside. You'll see little bitty bits. Can you see these little bitty bits? I don't know if you can. There's one. There's one. Those are proteins. You want to make sure that those are coagulated. So what we've drawn off from our mash is essentially unfermented beer. It's called wort. Now you can buy wort in a condensed form. See the syrup here? And it's called malt extract. Now you can use this to make beer. It's essentially wort. You just add water and boil it and you're at the stage that we're at now. However, we made our own wort by just extracting it from the grains because this is all grain brewing. What we're going to use this for though is later when we bottle, you have to add a little more sugar. We don't want to add sucrose. We don't want to add table sugar. We want to add maltose because that's what we're using. So it's a good thing to buy yourself a little package of malt extract. You'll use it for bottling. Now that the wort has boiled for about a half an hour, we're ready to add our hops. Remember to put half in each pot just like you distributed the wort. These hops now have to boil for about an hour. So what David has done here now is he's added what is known as the bittering hops. Hops have three functions in beer. One, they're a natural preservative. Two, they add bitterness, flavor, and aroma. And three, they will clarify your beer. They'll help your beer clarify. 
Now the reason they have to boil for about an hour is because it takes about that long for the chemistry to happen in the hops. Now this is all the hops we're going to add to this beer because we're trying to keep this nice and simple. But over an hour you're going to lose a lot of the smell and aroma. So what some people like to do is they like to hold back a little bit of the hops and they'll throw them in right at the end of the boil, about an hour from now. And as I said down at the store, there are many different types of hops. Some have different, you know, they have different aromas and different flavors, and they have different uh, strengths of bittering, so to speak. They call them AAUs. So you're going to have to try different recipes, mix and match, find the hops that you like best, find the aromas you like best, find the amount of bittering you like best. This is going to be a pretty simple beer. It's not going to be very bitter. We're not going to add any more hops. It's going to be a malty scotch ale. Oh, it's getting steamy in here. This beer has been boiling for an hour now. So we're ready to chill it down. Basically you want to chill this beer down as fast as you can. Now you can do that by putting in a sink full of ice water or you can run it in the shower under a cold shower. What we're going to do, which is the fastest way the home brewer can chill beer, is we're going to use a wart chiller. What this is is a coil of copper. We're going to run cold water through it and that will chill this puppy down in minutes. So I'll just hook it up to the sink. I've got a little adapter thing here that allows me to screw this onto my household faucet. So, you just run the cold water through this and it'll chill the beer very quickly. But you must be careful, this water that comes out is scalding hot. So as you can see, the cold water goes in one end and goes around the coil and out the other, thus chilling the beer down. Now, up until this point, we haven't been too concerned about sanitation because obviously the, boil, uh, the beer has been boiled on the stove. But once this beer is chilled down to 20 degrees, from then on, anything that comes in contact with it has to be sanitized, either with a bleach solution or with some sort of diversol solution or whatnot that you can get at the beer supply store. Also, once it's in the fermenter and later on in the carboy aging, you want to keep it sealed so it's not exposed to the air. Basically, airborne yeasts will spoil your beer, so you want to protect it as best you can. All right, this is, uh, yep, that's 20 degrees, ready to go. So we're just going to transfer this over to our other one, get it started. And David's going to pour that into our fermenter. Now this fermenter here has been soaked in a bleach solution along with the sieve and our hydrometer. So we're just going to filter out the hops. Go ahead, pour away David. Now I know that the air is dangerous for your beer at this point, but the beer needs some oxygen, to, or the yeast needs some oxygen to get started. So a yeah, vigorous pour at the start is a good thing to make sure that the beer is well aerated for the yeast to get started. But after that, you want to try to keep it uh, from too much exposure to the atmosphere. All right, that is the hops we filtered out. We'll just uh, throw that in with our leftover grist, oatmeal, basically the uh, barley that was left over after the mash. That'll go into the compost. And we're waiting for the next one to cool down. Okay, this one's ready now too. Here you go, Dave. Take this out of here. This is a hydrometer. What I'm doing is taking the uh, measurement of the weight of the beer. How much sugar is in the beer? It's called the gravity. So my original gravity for this beer was 1.050. 
when you talk to your uh, brew supply store guy, he'll explain to you how one of these works. It's not necessary to know, but in the end, you'll know how much booze you got in your beer. I also check the temperature. And we're at sitting at 20 degrees, that's perfect. Okay, now we're ready to pitch the yeast. We're using powder yeast, as I mentioned earlier. So you just sprinkle it on top, like so. Now we're gonna take our lid, we're gonna put it on. As the beer ferments, of course, it's gonna be spewing out gas, CO2. So we have an airlock on it. That will, air the gas, that will allow the gas to come out, but it won't let air go back in. So we seal this down tight, like that. And I'm gonna give it a bit of a stir, just to get the yeast all stirred in. Oh, there. Now we finally got the beer finished. Now we gotta wait about three days while it ferments. Well, we're off to the races now. The beer is at high croissant. In other words, it's at its peak fermentation. That's carbon dioxide that's coming off there. Let's take a look and see what's happening. That's the Croizen. There's a layer of CO2 over top of that, protecting it from the atmosphere. A thing of beauty. It's alive. Okay, it's been about three days now. We'll just take a look inside here. As you can see, the Croizen has dropped back into the beer. We know that most of the fermentation has taken place. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rack it, i.e. siphon it, into our glass carboy. In here it's going to condition or age for a couple of weeks until it's nice and clear. I've already sanitized and rinsed this carboy along with the racking tube because remember, Anything that touches the beer has to be sanitary. So, I just lift this up on here. <clears throat> and we'll rack. Okay, I've primed the siphoning tube with tap water, so I don't wanna suck it through with my mouth because my mouth may be a little unsanitary. This little job here keeps the siphon tube up off the bottom of the fermenter because the yeast is all pretty much settled to the bottom. So we'll just stick that there down inside. Put this end in our carboy and let her go. At this point, you want to be fairly gentle with the beer. You don't want to get a lot of air in it. So just set it at the bottom, let it do its thing. Okay, now that our primary fermentation is finished, we're gonna check the beer again with our hydrometer. As the beer has fermented, of course, there is less sugar and more alcohol, so the beer is actually lighter. So we'll fill this up. This up here. Just sort of spin this around, get the bubbles out of the road, and take a reading. With liquid yeast, you might find that this actually would drop down even lower to around 010. Dry yeast tends to not attenuate. That means it doesn't eat as much sugar as liquid yeast does. So it's still fairly sweet. Okay, it's reading 
at the 1.020 level. So to find out how much booze you got in your beer, you take that first reading, the original gravity, subtract the second reading, your finished gravity, and that number you come up with, you simply look on your hydrometer and you will find the corresponding alcoholic content. Now if that's a little too complicated, just have one or two and depending on how drunk you are, then you'll know. Okay, we're sucking up yeast. So we're all down to the bottom. You notice I tilted that back up just to make sure I got all of it. We'll take this out. And I'll take my airlock, which has been sanitized and rinsed. You just put a little bit of water in it and cork that up. I'll put this in a cool, dark place. Leave it there for a couple weeks till it clarifies. In three weeks, it's cleared and conditioned. Voila. One helpful hint, your average uh, bathtub holds about 40 gallons, so a half a tub is about 20 gallons. One cup of health, uh, household bleach should be good for that. Yuck, nothing like bleach water. We're ready to get bottling now. So what we've done is we've soaked our bottles uh, in our bleach solution for about a half an hour. Remember, everything has to be clean and sanitary that touches the beard. Don't forget that. We've, uh, you know, including the racking tube and uh, a bottling wand, which we'll be using. Um, it's a handy device to have. You don't, you don't have to have it. You can use your racking tube. I'll show you how to use that later. So what we're going to do now is empty them out. We're going to rinse them off good, all the bleach solution, rinse the bleach solution off. You can do that under the tap, or you can use this handy device called a bottle washer, and we'll show you how to use that. Okay, David is uh, rinsing out the bottles now. They've been soaking in the bathtub in the bleach water for oh, half an hour, 40 minutes. And uh, he's using uh, what is known as a bottle washer. It's a handy little device you can attach to your tap that makes washing and rinsing bottles really easy. 
However, you can just run them under the water if you like to rinse them out. Now we're ready to bottle the beer. So first we have to prime it. By priming it, I mean adding a little extra sugar and that will mean it will further ferment in the bottle, thus carbonating your beer. So I've boiled up two thirds of a cup of uh, malt extract and a couple of cups of water. We're going to use our sparge bucket for our bottling. It's been cleaned and sanitized along with the siphoning tube. It's a good idea to put your bottling malt in first. That way when you're siphoning the beer, it mixes in thoroughly. As the beer is flowing down, it's mixing in. And when it gets up to the top, when we're pretty much finished, we'll give it a nice gentle stir just to make sure that the bottling malt is evenly spread throughout the beer. It takes about two or three weeks for your beer to clear and to finish conditioning. This beer is three weeks old. It's clear quite nicely, uh, you can see as we're racking it into our sparge bucket. However, keep your eye on the airlock. If the airlock is still bubbly, you know your beer is still working, it's still fermenting. So don't bottle your beer until you can see that it has completely stopped all fermentation. Some beers take longer than others, so you just have to watch and, and see. Lagers, for instance, you want to age them for two, maybe even three months. But ales, two or three weeks is fine, and then you can bottle. Just keep an eye on the airlock, make sure that it's finished fermenting. Now so we'll just give this a gentle stir. You don't want to stir air into it, just want to make sure that the bottling malt we've used is thoroughly mixed in. run off some of the water we've used to prime it. Put it in the bottle and let her go. This bottle filler is just a little more convenient than using the siphoning tube. All you have to do is gravity feed it out of our sparge bucket into the bottles. There's a valve at the bottom. When you push down it opens up when you lift it off the bottom, it closes. As you can see here, we're using this special kind of bottle. It's a European bottle. They're very convenient as they are resealable. This way you avoid using bottle caps and a bottle capper. But as you can see, you can use any bottles you want. These are real cheap and easy to get at the grocery store. You can buy yourself a bunch or just collect them, pop bottles, just refill them. If you're going to use regular beer bottles, don't use the twisties. They're a lot harder to cap. You just want to use the regular old-fashioned beer bottles, brown beer bottles, stubbies. Beer now has to sit at room temperature for the priming to take place. We're going to have a tiny bit more fermentation happen. That's going to carbonate and pressurize the beer. That takes about a week. Oh boy, five gallons of Johnny's Rockin' Ale. We've been through the mash, we've been through the sparging, the boiling, the fermenting, aging. We're at the semifinals now and in one week we'll be going for the cup. Any cup, a beer mug, you'll be in your cups. That's when you can sit back and enjoy the beer you made, right? And no taxes, no taxes. Let's put her down in the basement. <laughs> Adio. I want to go down to the bed, some down there, beer, basement's a good, cool, dark place to keep beer, I want to go, hey Romeo, it's lots of beer down there.
So I've taken you through all the steps of your uh, basic uh, process of all grain brewing. Now here's a few helpful uh, tips, some information that might help you along the way. Uh, one, if you buy your grain and your hops in bulk, it costs less. Thus, the beer costs less. A lot less than you'll pay in those liquor stores, paying all them taxes and stuff. Forget that. Two, uh, when you're mashing, when the mash is sat for an hour and you're ready to start your sparge, don't stir your mash up. Because if you stir your mash up, you're liable just to pack it down. And when your mash gets packed down too tight, it restricts the flow of the sparge water through and out the bottom. This is what is known as a stuck mash. Now you may get a stuck mash through no fault of your own. Uh, sometimes it happens when you use uh, different kinds of grain which you may experiment with in the future. However, don't panic. What I do is I'll just gently blow through the mash tun, just lift the mash off the false bottom a little bit and suck back through, suck a little wart through. I may do that once or twice. That's always worked for me. It's got it flowing again. But worst case scenario, your sparge will just take a little longer than you expect. Another thing is temperature. Uh, it's very important in brewing beer that you keep your eye on your temperatures. You know, the temperature of the mash, uh, remember we talked about being between 65 and 70 degrees and that it doesn't uh, go above or below that. Just keep your eye on that temperature. Also the temperature in which you pitch your yeast. Uh, ale yeasts, uh, we pitch between 18 and 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, lagers, if you start making lagers, you're going to want to ferment them a little cooler, below 15 degrees. And also when you store and age your beer, we're making unfiltered, unpasteurized beer. The yeast is still alive. This is a live beer. Now yeast doesn't like to get really warm, doesn't like sunshine, it doesn't like big fluctuations in temperature. That can produce off flavors. So what you want is just a nice, cool, constant temperature somewhere, like a basement or whatever, just so it's cool and constant. So I emphasize that you make sure that you keep an eye on all the temperatures and all the different steps in the brewing. Uh, even when you serve your beer, you know, don't, you don't have to serve it ice cold. Serve it just cool. You'll be able to enjoy more of the flavor. And lastly, I can't overemphasize how important it is to keep things sanitary. Keep your brewing equipment clean and make sure that anything that touches your beer after it has been cooked and cooled to your pitching temperature, anything that touches your beer has to be sanitized. Remember, use a bleach, household bleach, or diver saw, whatever. Just make sure things are clean and sanitized. And after all that, I mean, you've done a lot of work. Now you want to enjoy your brew. So, enjoy a little Vancouver weather. Maybe sit down and watch a Canucks game. <laughs> Me, I've forgotten something. <laughs> <laughs>